Our staff will help guide you to those uh, empty seats. Welcome. It, it's great to have such a full house for our first event this season. This is the third year of Conversations, and we're delighted to have you all here uh, tonight. Uh, the full title of this series is Conversations from the American Academy in Rome. And for those of you who are with us for the first time, uh, the American Academy in Rome is the leading international center for independent study abroad. And I'm its president, uh, Mark Robbins. Each year, we bring some of the ma nation's most talented scholars and artists into a community in Rome in one of the most beautiful settings. And uh, we do this through awarding the Rome Prize and through people who are invited as residents. In the conversation series, we bring in uh, fellows, uh, residents, to talk about their work in the arts and humanities and to um, further our awareness as a culture of the importance of this critical work. Uh, and I, I'd like to recognize the Helen Frankenthaler Foundation. This is the first year that the Frankenthaler Foundation is supporting us and helping us to expand this series so that we can do presentations nationally as well as in New York. We'll be at the Menil later on in the year, and we'll also be in Los Angeles at the, um, the Red Cat at the, the Disney Concert Hall. And I'd like to thank um, the executive director of the Frankenthaler Foundation, Elizabeth Smith, who's with us tonight. Thank you, Elizabeth. <laughs> and each year at the Academy, we develop a theme, an overarching theme, and it's generally porous enough so that the work of the fellows and our residents can fit within that theme. And this year, uh, the theme is American classics. And we look at the relationship between uh, classicism, uh, the uh, founding of America, we look at both the myth and reality of the United States, and the way this plays out in painting, in, in writing, in film, uh, in music. Uh, and it draws inspiration from the deep palimpsest in Rome. This year, participants in this series will include artists like Ping Chong, uh, painter Amy Silman, scholars and writers like Daniel Mendelssohn, Colm Toibin, Kimberly Bone, Bose, our own wonderful director and a very talented classicist, composer David Lang and Andrew Norman, uh, filmmaker Paolo Sorrentino, as well as architects Richard Gluckman, uh, Mark Lee, and Sharon Johnston. So it's a rich grouping of scholars and artists in what you can imagine is a very robust community. We bring... Um, together tonight, two of the most creative designers uh, working in the United States today, and their work has an impact uh, that is uh, truly international. It's Michael Rock and Michael Beirut, who, um, besides sharing the first name and New Haven, and now I guess Cambridge as well, uh, they uh, share the depth and range of work which is really uh, graphic design and uh, broadly is about communications which takes the form of film, web presence, and print, and back again. It's a remarkably sort of complex web. And I know that you'll recognize their work even if you didn't identify the names of the designers with the work that you'll see. And uh, I'll show just a few of the images of uh, Michael's, both Michael's, and, um, and I'll start with Michael Rock, who's the founding partner and creative director of 2x4 uh, with his partner Susan uh, Sellers and uh, Georgine Estout. And uh, he's a professor of design at Yale University and now teaching in Cambridge as well at Harvard. And his projects have included a range of 
of, of strategic plans, environmental graphics, and media design, and he was a recipient of the 2000 uh, Rome Prize at the American Academy, and he's currently a trustee at the American Academy as well. Uh, Michael's also a, a distinctive voice in the world of design, and uh, I'll show a couple of images of the work that he's produced. So uh, we had met initially uh, when I was at the National Endowment for the Arts, and Michael had a, the task of thinking about a way of branding what was a government poster. And, uh, and you can see shades of the WPA and the kind of leaping uh, swimmers. Uh, kind of remarkable, powerful poster, and hard to imagine this was a government document, both of these. Uh, or working in collaboration with uh, Rem Koolhaas for the design of IIT, this uh, powerful series of portraits, uh, Mies van der Rohe, the kind of founding dean at IIT in Chicago, these uh, digitized, blown up uh, prints, uh, which really wrap the building both in interior walls and on exterior uh, surfaces. And many of you remember these patterns, these amazing plan views of dresses from 2004, 2005, waist down for Prada. Really great uh, to see planimetric skirts. And then again with, the, with Prada, but for the Prada Foundation, you're seeing an image from uh, the opening exhibition called Serial Classicism at the Prada Foundation in Milan, uh, which discussed the way in which images and figures are repeated historically and passed from Greek sources through um, many ages of Roman sources. Uh, again, partnering with Rem Koolhaas with the designers, uh, two by four was able to generate a really stunning show in uh, counterpoint in its materiality and form with these figures. And again, other sorts of figures for the Prada uh, runway show much more uh, recently, where all of the elements you're seeing were designed by two by four, uh, except, of course, for the dresses and uh, skirts on the models. And this series of books, multiple signatures, this double pun on signatures is something which anyone who's familiar with printing knows about the assembly of books, which talks about the very complexity of the way in which we read, understand, and, and uh, uh, make meaning through what we design. Michael Beirut is uh, a partner in the New York office of Pentagram and a senior critic in graphic design at the Yale School of Art. And prior to joining Pentagram's office in 1990 as a partner who is vice president of graphic design at Vignelli Associates. Uh, Beirut's projects have included identity and branding, environmental graphics and signage, exhibition design, packaging, and publication design. He's won numerous design awards, and his work is represented in many museum collections. His monograph, How To, was published by Thames and Hudson and Harper uh, Design in 2015, and he's uh, most recently a resident, 2016, in design at the American Academy in Rome, where um, he did a, actually a great program with one of our partners at Maxi, the new Museum of Contemporary Art. Um, this is uh, one of Michael's early posters for the Architectural League. In addition to this series of posters, a beautiful kind of um, vibration for light years for the Beaux-Arts Ball. Is, Michael's also known for the uh, um, series of posters for uh, the Yale School of Architecture, which are really stunning and also uh, monochromatic. Though this is from 1999. Or this wayfinding system uh, for uh, Manhattan, New York. Uh, as Cartesian as the city is, it can be confusing, and this helps find some order in what can be uh, a difficult place to read when you're on the ground, and it recalled for me the, those fantastic subway maps uh, years ago, the abstraction of the subway. Uh, or to a smaller city in upstate New York, uh, Syracuse, deciding that this town, which had, uh, was in its 
post-industrial nadir would uh, somehow find reuse and new use, and he cleverly uh, determined that you could parse Syracuse in very different ways. And uh, not only did he rebrand the city, but he worked on a series of five books, designing a five books about design and their relationship to economic redevelopment. Karen Stein was involved in this as well, who I see in the audience. And uh, on buses around the city, uh, you'll see um, the, the uh, images for the launch of this museum, the Museum of Arts and Design. It seems appropriate that Michael would have done this. And the um, kind of re-envisioning of the uh, uh, sort of uh, German uh, high Gothic typography uh, for the New York Times, for Renzo Piano's uh, building. And uh, now we see from uh, credit cards to Clintons, uh, there, I there is uh, an emphasis on the way in which we understand brand and we begin to value that identity. So um, with those few teasers of images of um, both Michael's work, um, uh, I'll say just a, a brief word about the evening. Uh, both Michael Rock and Michael Beirut will come on stage and without images, we'll have a conversation for about a half an hour or so, probably a little bit more, and, uh, and then we'll kick off um, questions from the audience, and I know we're all looking forward to hearing you speak about branding and America and uh, identity. So uh, Michael Rock and Michael Beirut. So, what do you have to say for yourself? <laughs> um, Michael and I uh, met uh, for breakfast uh, to kind of prep a little bit for this event. Um, we both are into prepping for events, by the way, uh, unlike uh, uh, certain presidential candidates. And, um, and in fact, I bring that up because inevitably, um, uh, as I think has happened in almost every conversation of more than five minutes I've had with anyone in the past, seemingly for the past 10 years, but at least the past 10 months, um, the conversation will turn to uh, politics. And one of the things that struck me, and not only for the obvious reason, was that um, this seemed like a, a year where, where, where branding seemed very kind of prominent in the political realm. And I can talk, you know, I can talk firsthand about what it's like to brand a presidential candidate. But I think when we were doing that work at the beginning of last year, um, they really weren't imagining that the Republican nominee would be someone who had, in effect, been managing a brand of his own for, you know, for decades, essentially. Well, I think that's, you know, in a way, if you take the Hillary work as branding a presidential candidate, it's really the first time we've had now a brand running for president in the sense that, you know, you have to take a look at uh, the candidate uh, um, as really an embodiment of this idea because that's really what the Trump phenomena had been for, in a way, for the last 20 years, which was to develop a brand and to expand that brand as much as possible. And it could be attached to casinos, it could be attached to buildings, and now can it be attached to the presidency? And I think that that idea, you know, that it, it's a kind of Trump presidency, this combination of, of branding, is really a new thing. And so I think what you did for Hillary is well within the realm of things that we know before. But I think this other right. thing is kind Relatively of... Relatively amateurish by comparison, <laughs> I think. Like, yeah. and, and, and in a way, uh, with the way everything is amateur. But, uh, <laughs> but, but I think that now it's, it's a really entirely new phenomenon. It's almost like we don't have a tool to talk about it or something. Right? Yeah, no, and I think you can sort of see... Or a tool to counter it or <laughs> critique it or anything else. You sort of see the, um, uh, you know, I mean, every day some new newspaper comes out with a, uh, the first, you know, f f like today the Atlantic is the first, the third time in uh, two centuries 
that it's uh, Lincoln and Johnson. Yeah, and I think it was Lincoln and Johnson, and then um, uh, uh, um, Johnson again uh, versus Goldwater were the two previous times that actually had uh, uh, um, wrote an endorsement of a candidate, and yet you sort of feel like it's just you know talking to it's not reaching that segment of the population that's going to say, wait a second, you know, if the Atlantic magazine says we yeah. I should be against this man, you know. <laughs> but, <laughs> but I wonder if we have to back up a little bit and figure out how we got here. Like how do we get to the point where suddenly brand is this operative term where everything has one, right? Syracuse has one and uh, Trump has one and uh, you know Candy has a brand and uh, IRS has a brand. Yeah. They, you know, every, everything now we talk about in, in through this one lens. And it wasn't always like that, right? Even in the course of our careers, we've seen that happen it kind of emerge in front of us, right? Yeah, I think, um, I mean, you can attribute it to a lot of things. I, well, there's, there's a couple of things at play. I think that um, um, if you, um, you know, we're both, we established we're both about the same age. We're both baby boomers. And, um, uh, and when we were growing up, there were like brands. It was Coca-Cola and Schwinn bicycles and flexible flyers. I mean, it's very Norman Rockwell sort of <laughs> scene, you know. But um, but like things, you know, they, they were like, you know, they're brand names, and mm -hmm. and what you know, you'd clamor for one kind of cereal or want hope for one kind of candy on Halloween. Um, but it was um, it was it, it was almost more like packaging rather than branding mm -hmm. so much. I think that the people at that point in time in nineteen in say 1960, 1956, 1963. Uh, thought they were just simply selling packaging, effectively packaging and marketing a soft drink. And if I don't, I assume you have these conversations too, but if you're talking to clients today, you know, that's sort of, if you sort of say, if you, if you meet a new client and you sit down and you take out your pen and notepad and say, oh, let's talk about how we will market your soft drink, they sort of look, look at you like, you know, I don't need, I can get anyone to do this. Right. What I want is to somehow, elevate the idea of my soft drink far beyond, you know, I mean, it used to be just, you know, maybe 10, even as recently as like 10, 15 years ago, kind of getting it up to the level of not just the soft drink, but the, the, the whole idea of refreshment would be sufficient. And now it sort of is, you know, kind of lifestyle defining choices, whether you drink this or that. And, and people really do, you, you chuckle, but I mean, uh, uh, the, even as I speak, there are PowerPoint presentations of remarkable length and complexity <laughs> being prepared that will back me up uh, in every detail, and much money is being paid for them. You know. Well, I really think there's a turning point, and I'm not sure exactly when it was, and I'm not actually sure who coined it, but I, I kind of think it was Nike, where they started to use this phrase "brand DNA." Right? Mm, yeah. And I think that biological metaphor that anything could have this DNA, and if you could discover that DNA, you would really know the essence of this thing, right? And that, that was somehow a transformation because that, as a theoretical construct, could be applied to anything. Like it might have been applied to Coke and to uh, cornflakes and things like that before, but there was this transformation where suddenly that notion that everything in the world had some kind of hidden secret, which was its essence, and if you could reveal that, then you would kind of unlock the, the world. Everyone would suddenly understand who you were. And it was suddenly everything became relatable. Like so, you could, if you could have its DNA, you understood what it was like. And that could be applied to, you know, the country of Nicaragua, and it could be applied to, you know, the missile pact, and it could be, you know, anything could yeah. have this this DNA. And suddenly that became the driving force. And I think that that's when this transformation happened, away from something that I think we learned when we were in school, which is corporate identity, which was you create a logo and a color palette, and you created this manual, and that was your identity. It's because consistency is good. Right, and, 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 together, but, yeah. but in DNA, it's something else, right? It's not about consistency, really. It's about that this personality, which could express itself in lots of different ways. Yeah, it yeah. could be sometimes it could be childish, and sometimes it could be serious, and and so it, it, in a way, consistency became kind of one of those things like marketing your soda. Yeah, you yeah. Know, it, it becomes something else. You have to go and yeah. create a personality for almost anything. Yeah, right? and and I think. Um, uh, you know, I mean, Nike, I guess, is as good an example as any because one of the things they were able to do, and this was, uh, you know, as long ago as the 1984 Olympics in L.A., they were able to advertise themselves really without really showing products. It was not about, like, that they had a superior product. They just simply associated what they did with the idea of athletic achievement and even strike athletic, just human, mere human achievement, right. you know. And that sort of was the brand that aligned with that. The thing that I find curious about, and I think the thing that the, the people like you and me end up getting approached by organizations and institutions and companies, 
is to answer the question, can you just go out and buy one of these things? Mm -hmm. Can you just go out and buy some DNA for yourself? <laughs> you know? Which you can. <laughs> yeah, but, but I mean, it's like... Um, um, yes. There's DNA mills all over the place. But, I, but you, 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 I mean, would you say... I mean, you, have you encountered situations where, where, where sometimes there actually is a real there there, and there's something to work with, there's something authentic, and you can kind of like build something off of that, and it gives you plenty of reference points? And on the other hand, cases where... You know, they sort of don't have anything, and right. they kind of like want you to just sort of synthesize it out of uh, like like an alchemist uh, um, in the lab, just make it out of. Well, I, I think that in a way, historically, there was this other thing that happened, which is the kind of rise of the conglomerate, and mm -hmm. the conglomerate really inherently doesn't have DNA, right? It's just basically a network of stuff. So it's really hard to say, you know, what ties all these things together if you own a bank and a credit card and an airline and you know, a factory in Latvia, and there's a whole yeah, series yeah. of things, and suddenly, like, what's your brand, you know? And so that, I think that's the case where you really, it was kind of manufacturing this thing. Like yeah, some, yeah. But I think that these authentic, I guess, you know, we could call them authentic practices in some ways, you know, that they're a business, they make something, mm -hmm. or there's a person who's really related to it. I think that there is something there that you can talk about and express. And so maybe that brings us to Mrs. Clinton, Secretary Clinton. And, you know, I mean, what was she asking you for? And, and what was that? What was, um, that what was that relationship like? What were you, you know, what's your DNA? Um, <laughs> it, there, the, Please, let's there, know. There were a couple things. We did it all. I mean, um, uh, the work we did, um, we had to work quickly and in utter secrecy. It was just me, a designer named Jesse Reed, and a project manager named Julia Lemley, and we did it as volunteers. We were not um, approached as pentagram. We were sort of approached to do this kind of sub rosa sort of project. Uh, and it was early in, it was before she'd announced, it was early in January uh, uh, um, 2015. And, um, and I, basically the, the initial brief was um, um, the client is, the client has 100% name recognition. So the normal thing that people come to you with, which is, I mean, b b believe me, I've sort of sold, I, so many times um, I've gotten complex briefs from people. Mm -hmm. And I'll sort of come out of a meeting and I'll say to someone else who's in the meeting with me, who I, you know, one of my colleagues, I'll say, this guy has just gone to too many parties and said, you know, I'm Joe Blow and I'm from XYZ Corporation. And then person, you know, I'm with XYZ and people just stare at him like, XYZ is, and he just, he just like enough already, right? If you say you work for Nike, you say you work right. for Apple, you say you work for some company people have heard of, say you work for, say you work for the American Academy in Rome, you know, it's sort of like at least people go, oh, that sounds cool. You know, you say, I work for, you know, I work for Amalgamated Widget. Oh, should I know? You know, and so, um, so like you know, mostly the, the holy grail is just like I want people to kind of, I want I want that thing to have a bit of magic mm. in it. I want people to. Just, just trust me more. Be more receptive to me if once they hear those magic words, whatever it is. That's, and they're mm -hmm. thinking that somehow they're convinced that the DNA, if so released, right. would if express. If you could finally that release this, then I, I would be who I was. Right, yeah. yeah. So I think in the case of um, of Secretary Clinton, the, uh, the 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 starting point was she is like everyone knows who she is, right? And. Um, uh, it was very early days. They had no idea who the opponent would be. They had no idea that she would have a challenger in the primary. Um, but the assumption was she was going to run. And um, I, her team has a lot of very smart people who I admire very, very much. I am a true believer in the cause and never, never thought twice about it. You're with her. I'm with her. Uh, and uh, um, hashtag. And um, uh, and and um, but I remember. Um, uh, Sort of like saying, well, like you know, let's reduce, let's kind of take our, let's not, let's not, not freak out about the history yet. Let's just figure out what technically this thing has to do. And this is the first campaign that's really happened in the age of social media. You can say that uh, twelve and 08 yeah, yeah. were that. And and what's funny, what people don't remember is that before 08, the idea of a candidate having a logo was like, what does that even mean? I remember. Right. I remember being interviewed by a guy from, I think it was Newsweek, who called me up and had heard that, had been calling around and someone had heard that I had opinions about Obama's graphics, which I did, and I admired them very much. I was on the phone with this guy, and I, and I say, well, you know, and he's saying, why, is his, why, is, why would anyone care about his graphics? And I said, well, first he's got this like, logo, which I think is really effective, and that's, of course, the O with the things in it, right? 
And the, I remember the reporter saying the logo, and I could tell him, I could tell him like writing that down. He said, now, now what is the logo exactly? And I said, it's that round thing. And he's like, wait a second, I've got the, I've got the website up. Is it on the website? And I'm like, yeah, it's that round thing with like the things in it. And he's like, oh, so you call that a logo? He writes on logo, round thing. You know, so right. flash can go eight years later, right. and it's like every single every single candidate that announces. Yeah, there's 17 brands there, there's there on stage. There's a sidebar right? so about, you know, should Marco Rubio have kind of like put just the continuous states mm -hmm. above the dotting his eye or what happened to Alaska and Hawaii. And, and Pence and Trump had the famous yeah, step the, in yeah, the, the thing. <laughs> Jeb with his exclamation right, right, yeah, mark. Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. so, all, so all of a sudden those things are surpassing interest, somehow, as all logos are these days, and a whole other thing we can go there with that. But um, so I thought, well, you know, not like eight years ago, like people weren't expecting that. Even four years ago wasn't a thing. And now it has to be something that will work on a Twitter feed. It has to be something about it. And also, um, there were two things that kind of came together in terms of the brief. One was that they didn't want it to look like anything in the past. They knew that kind of the, uh, that the line of attack that was the sole line of attack that was effective uh, in the first debate when Trump was saying you're st a status quo politician responsible for everything that's happened in the last 30 or perhaps 300 years, right. um, you know, that that sort of is what, what a newcomer could lodge and that anyone else would be a newcomer, mm -hmm. you know, right. because just because of her long public service. So um, we were never encouraged to put stars and stripes in it. We were never encouraged, in fact, to put wavy things that look like flags in it. They thought mm -hmm. patriotism was handled. They thought that you know, everything else was handled. And, and they also wanted something that was like simple. And I remember, and they wanted something that people could like do themselves. Mm -hmm. And I just remember thinking, okay, like what's the, how simple and reductive can we make this thing? And could we make it so that like a three year old could draw it? So it's really just a square with like a 45 degree angle. It's the simplest thing in the world. Um, I was also inspired by like, um, you know those W those WPA rural electri rural electrification <laughs> posters by <laughs> Lester Beale. Lester Beale, yeah, yeah. yeah. But I was really afraid to sort of like say. And then there were these Great Depression era posters <laughs> and arrows, you know, because I thought they'd say, "What? What did he say?" He said, "No, no, no. We're going forward, not back to 1934." And so, um, uh, and so, um, it was a lot of it was like technical, and then part of it, then we just we, we kind of like demonstrated you can do all these different things with it. You can put the pride rainbow stripes in it. You can put pictures in it. You can do these things, but you can do that. And then your supporters can do anything with it. Right. You know, and also it's, you know, what's interesting is that New Yorker cartoonists can do things with it. Right. New York Post cartoonists can do things with it. Your opponents can do things with it. But I think actually that kind of is part of the power of a good symbol is yeah. that it becomes manipulatable yeah. like that. You can't kind of inoculate it. Again, you can't enable people to use it in a positive way and simultaneously inoculate it so it can't be used in a negative way. So at any rate, uh, um, I, um, I, I met with the candidate two times in person, talked to her two times on the phone, and she's like one of the best clients I ever had. Completely <laughs> like engaged in the conversation, kind of like it's fo tracking everything you're saying, remembers everything you said, acts like it's important. Um, I think it's important, so she may have just been humoring me, but I'm mean, kind of like, <laughs> it, it, it would be so easy for a busy person to say, what's this next meeting? I'm tired, you know, it's like the logo guy, you know, really? You know, isn't, isn't there some second assistant person who can deal with this and get back to me? So she took it seriously, which I applaud. But I, I think that, that taking seriously is also a kind of phenomenon in our lifetime, yeah, right? Yeah. Because, you know, I think we, we were talking at breakfast how, you know, we grew up with the joke being that you know even your mother didn't know what you did when you were a designer, and um, you know, and I think there's been this really 180 degree turn in oh, that yeah, somehow, yeah. you know, and so, so suddenly the fact that Hillary Clinton is calling you back is meaningful, right? And yeah. and the fact that suddenly the design has moved to the front of the project instead of the end of the project, you know, that we've done all this now, can we have a logo? But now yeah. before we've even even started this thing, we're already thinking about this idea of identity and what we're going to do with it and what our fans might do with it and what our opponents might do with it and trying to think through all of those things ahead of time. You know, that that shows an incredible level of sophistication in an audience that even 20 years ago, I think, wouldn't have thought about those things or I, I wouldn't would, have thought at all about them. And, uh, you know, yeah. and so, I, so I do think that's this really radical transformation. And I, and I think that um, while I'm also with her, I think that it's, Trump's an incredibly interesting phenomena in terms of branding because, because he has this long history with branding. And, and if you remember that after Trump's huge loss of all of his casinos and things like that, the way that he made his fortune was basically by selling his brand and that he started to attach his name to things that he wasn't building, to things that he wasn't making. He would license his name to them. Yeah. And that licensing the name and that DNA, the DNA being 
glamorous, expensive, whatever you know you could say. The that best, the best, you know, tremendous, tremendously successful. You know, you know that that those those qualities could be attached to an steak. apartment building in Mumbai, and Shirts. it could be a steak and a shirt, and that 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 Trumpness became this thing, right? This quality, and and in fact, I think that in certain ways, you know, there's a, a story that that uh, when he was offering Kasich the vice presidency, uh, his son called him and said, you can handle all of domestic and foreign policy. To Kasich. Yeah, to Kasich. And then he said, well, what's Trump going to be doing? He's going to be making America great again. You know? And that, I, <laughs> but that idea, so you, but, but in a way, that's actually. exactly the same system, yeah. right? Which is you give away all of the work part of it, and you just brand it. You brand the work <laughs> with this name. Yeah, yeah. And I think that, so, so it, and that's why I think there's this fundamental difference that's happening, which is like branding the, the candidate, then branding the presidency with these qualities, and then suddenly the, you know, it would be the most successful, tremendous, uh, bigly, uh, yeah. You know, uh, presidency you could ever imagine, yeah. and because it would take that DNA from Trump, and you'd you know uh, bring it out into the presidency. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and in fact, when um, it's, I mean, it, what's so interesting is when um, you know someone someone could say, um, having heard my story, if they're uh, if they want to make the case that um, Hillary Clinton's inauthentic, they could sort of like say, well, that proves it. You know, she's kind of like had to go off and kind of purchase you know her brand, and and in fact. Uh, there were um, uh, advocates for Bernie Sanders who sort of pointed to the fact that the Bernie Sanders phenomenon was completely grassroots. No fancy logo designer was for Bernie. Mm. It was just, you know, on the other hand, someone specked that Clarendon with the thing. You know? So um, that wasn't, you know, so some, someone someone did something for him. But like it, it, it sort of seemed like, but like on the other hand, um, you know, um, authentic, serendipitous kind of grassroots phenomenon by their nature sort of like can't be designed in theory, you mm -hmm. know? And so you sort of have three versions of this with, with bizarrely the most inauthentic one of all, mm -hmm. Trump sort of simultaneously seeming to kind of be the most powerful almost because it's been liberated from any, you know, any requirement that it relates to Policy or activity real. or yeah, anything yeah. behind it because it's pure brand. Yeah, pure, it's pure brand. It's pure yeah. DNA. It's kind yeah. of, you know, in the lab it's been extracted from everything else and yeah. now you have pure DNA. And it's been separated from everything else. Right. Yeah. But, but on the other hand, I think that grassroots even, you know, has become a kind of brand in itself. You know, I think the term is astroturf, but I think that, <laughs> you know, that uh, it's this kind of... Um, uh, separating out, and so someone, you know, when you make the choice of Simon and Garfunkel for Bernie's ad, yeah. you know, obviously that fits with some brand, right? That, yeah. You know that they're using that and not Twisted Sister or something, you know. So it's it's a it's a choice they make because that builds towards something else. And, and if you have this clear idea of the brand, then it, that allows you to make choices like that. Like if the brand is this, then we shouldn't use this song, but we should use that song, and we should use Clarendon and not Helvetica. You know, yeah, you have yeah, like yeah. these choices that you can make because. The brand is clearly in in mind, and and I think that designers always kind of did that on their own. It just mm -hmm. became, but I think that suddenly it became a science, and then it became this kind of uh, highly lucrative business to go into to express that, even yeah. though it was something that was always internalized before. So, how, how much do you think? I mean, I, 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 have a th I have a theory that you can either agree with and embellish or challenge, <laughs> which uh, which is that. Um, one of the big sea shifts that happened was when it used to be that everything people like you and me did was like this high priesthood of mysterious and somewhat mm. boring stuff. Yeah. You know, the names of typefaces and the names of PMS colors and what is it you do again and like then people would hear and it would just sound kind of confusing and you know and, and they people actually do that. Yeah, yeah, people right? do that. That's weird. You know, I don't even <laughs> get that. And um um and then somewhere along the way, people, be, like you said, became interested in it. And I think actually it started when the tools that once were professional tools that you needed training and investment, to, mm -hmm. inv investment to acquire the tools and training to operate them, um, became just open source more or less. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, honest to God, I mean, I remember having a conversation in probably the early '80s, well before, uh, th th where someone says. Someone said, you know, this guy says that all these different kinds of letterings have different kinds of names, you know, and it's like, you know, what's that one called? And it was like, it was like, it was like bird watching or something. And so, you know, well, that's a blue speckled Helvetica. Right. That thing's, a, you know, um, and it was sort of like, wow, it's like it was like a whole new world. And like, and who would have thunk? And who cares, you know? Yeah, yeah. Then I think all of a sudden the personal computer was invented, and every single person had to go to a menu and choose between Ariel or charcoal and Trebuchet and all these things, and suddenly. First, they all of a sudden had to make the choice, and suddenly, then they realized that the choice 
that they liked some choices better than others, that other people responded better to certain choices than other choices. Mm -hmm. And I think the end game, or well, not the end game, but now we're at a state where if every single, if everyone's got their own Facebook page and everyone is kind of like picking, selecting pictures for their Instagram feed or their if comments for their Twitter feed, they're actually doing exactly the same thing that William Randolph Hearst was doing, mm -hmm. you know, so in a publishing empire, coming up with words, coming up with pictures, mm -hmm. sending them out there in the world and seeing what people would do, you know? And oftentimes combining them in these very complex ways because suddenly the ability to make a Photoshop collage or to, you know, switch heads in a, a, a picture and put a funny yeah. one in and then add a type to it. So that's really graphic design, right? Yeah, yeah. Which is like you're making a collage and you're adding type to it and then you're broadcasting it somehow. And all of that's been brought down to kind of one place now where it can all happen in, you know, kind of the back, you know, in your bedroom. And, and, but I think that you have also this incredibly powerful way to broadcast too. And so, you know, an Instagram is a brand device, right? Yeah. Because suddenly you have to go and choose the pictures that you're going to put up and you start becoming really conscious of them. And I only picture, do sunsets or, you know, yeah. these are all cats or, you know, but that's, those are choices and, and obviously really obvious choices. And I find it really interesting when, you know, my kids start making those decisions. Like, what, what am I going to post about myself? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, and that's really a, a kind of brand building exercise, right? Like, this is, this is me yeah. and this isn't me or something. And, and, and it's actually yeah. hard. I mean, how you're, you have 12, 12, and 12. 15. Yeah, yeah, I mean, it's really, I mean, it's, my kids are a little bit older than that and the older, and the older two, I think, remember a time before that. But I think it's, um, uh, um, you know, people, like, I, re, you know, I remember, like, the idea, there was no analog to that. You know, when yeah. uh, when I was 15. Yeah, there's no way you could speak to thousands yeah. and thousands of people. I, I mean, I had like a journal that I wrote all my furtive <laughs> thoughts down in, and then I, then I was like given because I was good at art. I was given art projects that you know a poster for the school play, and that would hang around the play, and mm -hmm. even you know have multiple copies of it. And I sort of like, wow, that's exciting. I want to do this for a living. Right. <laughs> but it wasn't like you know a magazine called me about me that would yeah. sort of be something where I would want you know people to sort of really oh I love you see that latest thing from Michael Bay like no. Yeah knew who I was, and right. no one should have known who I was. Yeah. And that I you, wasn't could, you could knowing. build a following, a global following, yeah. you know, that you, you could be a 12-year-old and build a global following of people who are interested in what you have to say, yeah. and how you say it, and what your eye is, and what your style is. Yeah, that right. Those things could become distributed in this way effortlessly, and I think that that's had such a profound effect, and, and good and bad, I think, but in this way that suddenly you become very conscious of what you're putting out there, yeah. like what you put out there about yourself, and you're making choices, and what that says about you. And I think that all of those are design choices, I think. They're the choices that we would make when we were editing a magazine, or when we were yeah. going and deciding what pictures went to an annual report, or something like that. Yeah, like, yeah. is this you, or is not you, you know, so. Yeah. yeah. And, you, and, and one still makes all those choices. I mean, you mm -hmm. still, there are still magazines to be edited, and, and websites to be designed, and things like that. But, but you sense that you're doing it for an audience that's much more, Sophisticated, maybe? Are they more savvy, sophisticated? Maybe, savvy? Yeah. yeah. yeah but I mean, are they? Or I don't know. Right. Maybe, I mean, maybe it's the question are they uh, sophisticated in the techniques? Because there's discussion about technique now, right? You yeah. know, I mean, part of, again, going to the Trump thing, the whole discussion about Twitter and its power is a constant discussion now, right? Yeah. People are talking about media and how media works. Yeah. And that's like on the front page of the New York Times. And there'll be discussion about how it's being used and how it's changing something. So this media critique that might have been used to be in your, you know, study in, in university or something like that, where you have these kind of classes, suddenly that's become mainstream too. Yeah, in, yeah. This, in the same way that the media has become ubiquitous, the critique of the media has become ubiquitous at the same time. And and I think that does make people really aware of it. And they're, you know, I, I find that the, the the kind of just general critique of things going on is really surprising. People are, are saying what he's trying to do, why he's doing it, why he's positioning it this way, yeah. what he's trying to get out of it, what people think will, they'll get from it, how will it affect the polls. Those are all kind of very sophisticated critiques of communication. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, if someone would have told me that this, that that level of both awareness and sophistication and um, uh, critical faculty would be arising among the general population, I would sort of think, oh, that sounds fantastic. <laughs> and surely we're about to enter some new age where people will just... Uh, um, you know, have access to all this information, acquire this facility with processing the information, and be able to make wiser, better choices on behalf of themselves, their families, and their country. Yet, um, <laughs> that doesn't appear to be happening in a resounding right. sort of way, certainly. So, 
you know, yeah. well, I was just, I was actually, weirdly enough, reading, rereading Hofstetter's paranoia, the paranoid style of American politics recently, and he has an incredibly prescient thing there, which is saying that as mass media makes politics personal, that everyone feels like they can participate, and that just keeps a constant state of agitation at that point. And mm -hmm. I think we're at that point, right, which yeah. is that every single day, you know the most minute detail about something, and that's communicated through pictures and through things that are repeated over and over again, and words and tweets and things like that. And so the, it, it creates this fever pitch, which is constant. Yeah. And so I guess the, the question is, yeah, there's, there's all these interesting things are happening, but what's lost in all of that, you think? What, you know, what, what, what have we lost by having so much connection, so much imagery, so much uh, communication? Um, well, I mean, you can, this, I, I, this, you're tempting me to kind of sound very like a sophist <laughs> or something, but, uh, um, but, but you know, I mean, and this has sort of been a, uh, kind of an obvious sort of thing, but I yeah. do think if you're kind of going through life and everything is sort of material, mm. you know, th that, that you're kind of assessing constantly, can I use this and, you know, in what way can I turn this and publish it to a broader audience refracted through my own personality to kind of more clearly define my personality. It, um, you know, it sort of is, it's, it's, it, it can't, it can't help you be kind of, it can't help you live in the moment and actually perceive the world around you with additional clarity if you're constantly kind of assessing so, it in that so, way. So we're, we're, it's inevitable that cynicism follows that somehow? That I, well, I'm, I'm really trying to avoid that, but, you know, <laughs> but uh, um, I know that when I was in, um, when I was in Rome uh, as uh, earlier this year with my residency with the academy, at one point um, I was I was doing the tourist stations and uh, I was meeting Dorothy um, at um, St. Peter's actually and uh, my w lovely wife Dorothy at St. Peter's and uh, um, I was in f I was I, I was meeting her by the not right next to but like near the entrance where the PA tie is and man there were people taking lots of selfies. With the Pieta, you know, with yeah. selfies, it's kind of like going like, you know, like that, you know, or whatever face you make. I, I, I'm, you know, you know, those faces you make when you take a selfie. And meanwhile, you know, the, the, the you know, the, the crucified savior in his, uh, you know, virgin mother's arms lies behind us, a masterpiece of Western art and a kind of icon of, of religious devotion just simply as a backdrop to kind of proving, you know, I was, you know, I was there, you know, and, and so were they, you know, and I, you know, it's sort of, it's like, it's, it's like, on the other hand, I'm not sure there's any way, you know, if you kind of, plenty of writing that would, that goes back a lot further than any of these tools, I would argue that since the invention of the printing press, your ability to kind of look at something like that and have a direct appreciation of it has been debased or somehow not right. possible anymore. Well, but I think that there's a, s a specific guess. case right now <laughs> where part of the loss, if we think about the loss, is that if the language of branding becomes ubiquitous and everybody discusses it and everybody discusses each other's brands and the competing aspects of them and which one's good, the loss ultimately is the belief in any kind of authenticity, right? That, that everything is just seen as a series of competing differentials <laughs> That you know, United is continent, not continental until they become one thing, and suddenly they're one thing. You know, and so, so you know, you just see the world as a whole series of um, of competitions, just defining different territories somehow. And so Hillary defines a certain territory, which is not Bernie and not uh, Trump, and and Trump defines another territory that's not this. And so, you just you, you don't you no longer really see them except in their differential quality. Yeah, and I think there is people take this perverse comfort in this dystopian idea that it's all being masterminded somehow. Right. You know, if you think about like you know George Orwell and the moment in 1984 where it's decided that um, the war is no longer against East Asia but it's against Eurasia, and then everyone just starts everyone stops chanting down with East Asia and down, mm -hmm. instead starts chanting down with Eurasia or right. vice versa. I forget which it is. Um, and, it, and suddenly, you know, this idea that like there are people pulling the levers uh, somewhere, and I think it's actually more of this, uh, this like Hobbesian war of all against all, where everyone sort of has brands of different sizes. No one really knows quite what they're doing. People inadvertently manipulate them. I'd like to think that Donald Trump had this master plan that he's been putting in motion since, uh, uh, you know, since. Uh, the, his first uh, uh, catastrophic financial loss in the 90s. But, but it, may, it may, may be the case, you know, that kind of coming up with a business model where, which is about proliferation yes. of a brand somehow. Yeah. 
And, and, in, and in fact, a lot of people simply feel that, uh, I mean, there's, you know, there's this one theory that I'm, I assume everyone in this room has heard that in a, in, in a way he's going to win either way. And in fact, probably would, it would all work out much better if he doesn't actually have to be put in a position where he would be expected to do that work that we know being president entails, mm -hmm. right? Instead, he sort of like uh, goes all the way and then kind of comes out the other side having narrowly lost being elected president, but having, you know, 100% name recognition, mm -hmm. a newly impassioned and activated base of enthusiastic supporters far beyond anything that he's demonstrated or far beyond what uh, what any media outlet has done. He's surrounded himself with media people already who are ready, just going to be perfectly situated to inaugurate the Trump network or the Trump whatever, you know, and, and so. Well, and I think that's, that also brings up this other aspect of brands, right, which is that... Is it a, is it a cheerful, optimistic aspect of brands? Well, I, I would love to... A, well, I, I think it can be read in a couple of different ways, but I think that oftentimes you think about creating brands for people when actually I think brands coalesce people, right? So, yeah, yeah. so no one quite knew there was a Trumpian audience there until you had the kind of Trump brand to coalesce them. Yeah. And, um, and that's why I think people are often identified with the media they consume somehow. Like you identify yourself, I'm an NPR listener or yeah, something like yeah. that, and like that, that makes an audience that you didn't realize existed before. So in that way, I think the positive aspect of that is that it does build community to a certain extent. That that's the way that we build community. We, we, you create coherence in life by defining something and attracting people to it and gathering around that thing. And that seems really human to me. And, and it made it happen in lots of different ways. It just happens fast and in this very technical way and in a somewhat uh, self-analytical way, but it's still very human. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and that explains why people will have these like o overreactions, like nowadays um, to, you know, if a logo is changed, people who aren't being paid to care about it and who by all, you know, by any, by my, by, in my opinion, shouldn't really have, shouldn't, shouldn't really care about it because you know, they've got, they should have better things to do. We'll go on Twitter and say, look at the horrible new MasterCard logo or that, you know, or, uh, you know, they'll, they'll, they'll sort of like surprisingly have opinions about institutions that you'd think um, uh, would just simply seem like more remote in their lives. On the other hand, those institutions have been spending a lot of money to be anything but remote. Right. They're trying to be central to those people's lives. And so naturally, when all of a sudden they make some change, people are going to feel, oh, you're messing with something that I now realize I care deeply about. And that's why I think it's really a really human, really basic human function, which is that this defines who we are as a group. Mm -hmm. and, and that might sound bad, like I'm a Nike wearer, yeah. but that, that's, that's a group like any other group, right? And, and you're defined around this thing, and, and you share in some of those qualities to that brand. And in fact, um, uh, that's that may be an incredibly human thing. It's certainly based on any reading I've done a very very American thing, mm -hmm. where this like kind of passionate identification with your religious parish, with a sports team, with all these things. I guess it. I guess it's human overall, but it's yeah. certainly something about the size of the country and the mobility, the size of the United States, the mobility of its citizens, mm. um, you know, the, the historic kind of like spread from the east to the west and everything has made people like, you know, has created this hunger to identify with things. That, but I think it's some pretty rabid Manchester United fans. Uh, I know, right, I was right, thinking right. that as I sort of said sports, <laughs> right, I realized, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, that it's not just American, but you know, I, and I, uh, you know, Kurt Vonnegut had this, Theory that I may have mentioned to you some other time. Because I love it. astrology. You know, his, <laughs> uh, his, his, he had he was being he's talking about how rootless and kind of the lack of community in contemporary America. And his theory was that um, everyone on birth should be given a government issued middle name um, of one of <laughs> sixteen, say, and they could be anything. They could be named after flowers like dandelion, tulip, sunflower, mm -hmm. right? And you'd be one of these 16, and that would be different from your surname, different from any other affiliation you have. But it would automatically brand, it would brand you as a member of this larger tribe of which only one out of 16 people, mm -hmm. by the nature of physical distribution, belonged. And so then, like, if you were kind of like in town and you just want to go out for a drink, you'd say, hey, what other dandelions are in town? <laughs> you know, you know. Or if, you know, you're, you know, if you had to go out and you're like, um, uh, you're, you know, you need a, you know, emergency, you need a babysitter, and say, hey, I, you know, I, you're a dandelion, right? Can you help out a fellow dandelion? I just need, you know, I just need someone to watch my kid for three hours while I do, you know. And then, and then the interviewer, this is an interview, the interviewer said, well, you know, but like, 
you know, or he'd say, you know, uh, you know, I really need money. You know, uh, could you lend me ten bucks? And and this, and he's being interviewed. He said, well, I mean, why would you? You, you could be turned down. He says, yeah, but you you, you could turn on your brother-in-law too. It's a deadbeat brother-in-law. He says, you know, it's family. Yeah, you're always, you know, not this time, Joe. You know, and so there was something about just sort of like. Um, what he was pinpointing was sort of, in a way, the deliciously arbitrary nature of it. And if you're a sports fan, you know that um, uh, your passionate identification with Manchester United or the New York Mets or whatever is based on a lot of things, none of which are rational. You know, there's no real reason. You know, I mean, like, it's like your dad or your mom or your uncle or something or you had some formative experience or you really like that one player or, you, well, you know, it's just sort of like, and then you just fixate on it, and then all of a sudden it seems really, really important that that team win, you know? Well, and I think Poke Pokemon Go has basically proved that, right? Which is you have these, <laughs> these arbitrary teams that suddenly, like, I'm on the team with Kim Kardashian. Who knew? <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, absolutely, yeah. Well, it elevates you in some way, right. yeah. Pokemon Go seems like a good place to <laughs> exactly. start and open this up. But before we open this, it's, it's great. I could sit and uh, listen to both of you talk. It's great from WPA to DNA <laughs> and in between. So. Um, um, you know, I'm thinking about this conversation besides Trump and how somehow appropriately Roman this discussion seems about someone ascending with this mm, kind yeah. of power and fanfare. Um, but, you know, you were talking, uh, Michael Rock, earlier about uh, conglomerates, right? We're no longer hanging a piece, uh, you know, a, a picture of a loaf of bread in front of a bakery when you have to rename Philip Morris, which is cigarettes, and you have to think about Altria, what is an Altria, mm. and what would Altria look like? Right, so somehow it ends up as a grid. How, how do you think, and this is to, to your point, Michael, where you said, you know, it's not based on rational connections. It's based on associations which we may or may not be aware of. How do you design in such a way that people understand what you want to communicate about Altria? Mm. Well, How do you get them to think what the sort of the, the management, the corporation, would like people to think about it? Well, you know, I, I'll let Michael go after the, but you know, I think that if you think about again, brand is just a kind of set of coherent things that are tied together somehow. You can have coherences within coherences within other ones, and you know, I, I was thinking about it must have been in the early '80s when. There's a large conglomerate, a food conglomerate called Beatrice, right? <laughs> yeah. And, I'm saying about Beatrice. Yeah, and at a certain point, Beatrice, Beatrice makes Beatrice. Tropicana Beatrice. orange yeah. juice and uh, Peter Pan peanut butter and, you know, detergent. And it decided that on all the commercials, at the end, there'd be this little tag that comes and say, like, we're Beatrice. Beatrice. And it freaked everyone out, you know? It's like, <laughs> like, suddenly all these things you thought were distinct yeah. things yeah, suddenly yeah, were yeah. giant, you know, yeah, part of this yeah. gigantic web. And it was a complete failure yeah. because no one wanted to think that your peanut butter and yeah. your detergent no, are made by Pillsbury the same thing. No, was We're Beatrice. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. There was some Comedian, there might have been someone like Stephen Wright, right. and he sort of like said exactly that. And then he says, like, "Man, who is this chick?" <laughs> <laughs> but, but you know, but I, but I think that that's this idea. Like, you don't really want to know yeah. in some ways. You yeah. wanted to think that that Peter Pan is a distinct thing, and that's it's a coherence, and that, not that it's part of a bigger thing. You know, yeah, and yeah. and I think where that gets cut off, and that's why I think a lot of those conglomerates didn't work ultimately. You know, because they became so detached from anything, and yeah. so they started burying themselves, and that you know they. The raise up the product or the thing, which could be relatable, but you don't really want to know, you know, the story behind it. Yeah, but it, it does go back to that cocktail party moment where, you know, it, it's not a cocktail party specifically, but the people who cared about Beatrice then were stockholders in a thing called Beatrice, and it didn't matter how Beatrice was making this money; it just needed to make a lot of money. And the fact that Beatrice was a good thing that made a lot of money because it owned all this stuff. It didn't matter to you if you bought orange juice that Beatrice was involved, but if you were a stockholder in something you know, in, called Beatrice, it seemed like you know, of, of more interest. And then I think there's this leap that advertisers and marketing people tend to make, which is that if the stock analyst is watching the Super Bowl right. and is surrounded by a bunch of people, then the Beatrice commercial comes on, you know, that person gets this tremendous reinforcement that Beatrice really is important, you know, yeah. and everyone cares about Beatrice. Right. So I'm, I'm putting, I'm really going to buy a lot more Beatrice stock now. <laughs> you know, I think that right. must be, that must be how the theory operates, right. you know. Yeah. But I agree. It's sort of like I tell, I'll tell people all the time, you know, Procter and Gamble makes Pringles and Prell and Pampers, mm -hmm. and no one says, you know, the, sh you know. If, if the diapers are good, you know the potato chips. <laughs> so, you, you mentioned before I just one. This is just a very quick one-two question. 
Uh, you mentioned Lester Beale. So what logos that have, what Paul Rand, what logo has gone by the wayside that you miss? You, Michael, and Michael. Yeah, you start. Oh, I'm not um, sure I miss any logos. They're, they're always around, right? They never go anywhere. No, I mean, <laughs> you still find them, actually. Right, it's yeah. interesting, yeah. Even though, uh, um, oh, you know, it's not so much when they, when they disappear, it doesn't, it's not so bad. It's when they're replaced with something terrible. And, uh, <laughs> you know, there's this great logo that uh, a contemporary of Lester Beale's Charles Coiner did for the, uh, uh, for the civil defense thing, which oh, is right. beautiful C yeah, and a D, yeah. and a yeah, yeah. it was so great. Then it's re in, in replaced with some insane thing that had an upside down Nike swoosh with stars, <laughs> and it was terrible. But then um, uh, I was actually up at Yale um, uh, a few weeks ago, and I was at Yale Press, and they had in their lobby a carved version of the Paul Rand Yale yeah. indicia mm -hmm. that used to appear in all those Yale Press books. I can tell it's an erudite crowd, so I can drop that reference <laughs> with some. Impunity, I hope. And now, because of a decision that Yale University made that everything Yale would be branded in an identical way, mm. um, they actually eliminated that. It's, and I was actually shocked by that. You know, mm. I sort of thought, well, you know, someone, at, uh, someone from Yale Daily News actually interviewed me and said, well, what do you think of this? And I said, well, you know, if the goal is to reinforce the fact that Yale Press is connected to Yale University, this is an effective way of doing it. If there's supposed to be some sort of editorial independence between those two things, this is probably not the best way to express that, mm -hmm. but they sort of obviously wanted to express the, the cohesion, that's what you were talking about. But I, but I think also you can't discount the, the incredible power of nostalgia around these things, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. And, um, and the, the case I was thinking about was how, you know, NASA had that weird kind of oh, well. science fiction thing. It moved to this very 70s, quick, beautifully designed yeah. uh, typography. Then they went back to the uh, to the original thing because they thought that the '70s thing lost the thrill of space travel, mm -hmm. and then everyone's now nostalgic for the '70s thing now. You know, so so <laughs> it, it, I think it's so it's so much like fashion in terms of what's in and what's out yeah. and and what feels good at the time and what you remember from your youth and this so many factors that go into it. I don't think it has anything to do with if they're the efficacy at all. I think it has to do and, with and or the inherent. Inherent Goodness things or, yeah. you can say about like shapes and colors and no, stuff no, like that. I, 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 I tend to agree. Actually. I've kind of given up on all of those, uh, you know, absolutes because I think that really bad things can be incredibly powerful and effective <laughs> marks, you know, yes. and bad things meaning if you look at them on purely a formal level or in, in terms of principles of modernism or something like that, you just say it's a piece of complete banal uh, trash and it absolutely it works, works, works perfectly works. As, as to create a coherent brand. And so yeah. I'm not sure the kind of goodness in terms of pure formal yeah. things really yeah. has anything to do with it. I think it was Noel Coward who said, funny how potent cheap music is. <laughs> so yeah, it's, yeah, uh, yeah. it's similar. Um, why don't we open this up? There's a uh, man who's had his hand up. And, and there are microphones, because I think this is being um, uh, streamed. Thank you. Um, in creating and then managing a brand for an individual or a corporation, what is the one important similarity? One is the, what is the one important difference? Between a corporation and an individual? In creating and then managing a brand for an individual or a corporation, what's the one important similarity? What's the one important difference? <laughs> um, I'd say the, I'll take a shot. Okay, um, no, I'd say the, I, the I'm, I'm similarity is that, um, I mean, Consistency, which seems like a fairly cheap, easily achieved commodity, is actually pretty hard to do because people people tend to get bored. People tend to get bored, and um, they tend to get bored at the moment when other people are just noticing, sort of, right? So, um, no matter you know, no matter what it is, you just I mean, I, like if someone just said, "I want to have a well-known brand," I would say, "Pick pick pick a bunch of things at random, just do them over and over again." And just keep doing them, and eventually those things will become your trademark. You know, it should be something you like, yeah. something that sort of fits your personality. It doesn't have to be either of those things. As long as you did them over and over again, people would say, "Here, there, there goes that guy with the funny glasses or the white suit or the mohawk haircut or whatever." So consistency is important, and that's true for corpor corporations too. Where it's different, I think, is that corporations, in a way, have an inherent kind of stability in them, where if if you, if you, they're in a way they're harder to brand because there's armies of people who have to be convinced that it's the right thing to go. They're all very risk averse. You have to, 
get in front of boards of directors and everyone sort of has to slowly agree they're going to do this thing. But once they do it, they sort of, you know, that's, they feel like that's done. We're going to move on with that. And there's not, it, ha it has to be a fairly amazing catastrophe for something to happen that sort of negates whatever it is you were trying, the premise of the, of, of the work you had done. An individual in theory, and, and this history of branding individuals isn't a, a long one, but I mean, people can, scandals can happen, accidents can happen, all these things can happen to single people that actually kind of can turn their brand from one thing to another. But on the other hand, you know, you look at, say, someone like Pee Wee Herman, uh, and Paul Rubens was, you know, the beloved Pee Wee Herman, then was discovered uh, um, doing something unsavory in a, uh, you know, in a pornographic movie theater, and suddenly the Pee Wee Herman brand seemed to be <laughs> ruined, although then he sort of came back, and then he did come back, you know, yeah. so it's, uh, you do get these second acts in American Lives, you said that? Uh, yeah, except he had to do time. CGI. Had to yeah, yeah, yeah exactly, yeah. Yeah. makeup age. and But I think that the... Uh, well, first of all, corporations are people, as we know. Right? <laughs> too. So, yeah. uh, you know, Mitt, <laughs> oh. us. But, but what Mitt was actually really saying, even though it was a colossal misstatement, was that corporations are made up of people, right? And, and so, in a way, you have multiple people who have to make a decision. And, uh, and I think that there's just that difference between the dynamic of dealing with a group of people who have to jointly make a decision about something which is not themselves, but something else. And I've worked also for companies, e even companies but are, that are run by one person. Yeah, exactly. Is, I was going to say, yeah. that's where the two things come together. You know, a company that's run by a person who the company's named after, for instance, you can test really well if they like it or not. You know, and you're using their uh, filter to make decisions, right? So uh, you know, it either feels right or doesn't feel right to that person. And so rather than being this abstract act where a bunch of people get together and are, are kind of saying, you know, is this right? Does this fit in the market? Or you know, how does it relate to this other one that does it? You're talking to one person and saying, you know, is this you or not? And I think that that's a really, that's a really fundamental difference about the way that you uh, align your work to the thing that you're representing. Great. Do we have a? Yeah. Thanks. Um, oh, thank you. Hi. Um, so you're talking about the creation of brand and brand management and using the Trump example of you know, unfortunately, what a master is at this brand. But it actually has nothing to, or I don't think it has anything to do with design. And so I wondered if you would talk about your role as graphic designers or as designers in creating the various ways you create brand. I mean, so, and, and maybe even confirm that Trump created this brand without any, what we would think of as, uh, design in a graphic or visual way? Well, I mean, Trump might be the perfect example of what I just mentioned, this, yeah. you know, this corporation, which is a person, the, the, the state is me, right? Um, but uh, on the other hand, I think that it has everything to do with design. That's where I would disagree with you. I think that so much of our work actually has become dematerialized in thinking about these things that happen before you even start doing that stuff we normally think about design. It's about defining those characteristics. And there's a long, at least, you know, in the course of our practice, I think that we spent most of our time on the, the point of starting to make something and going forward, and that's shifted all the way over to, that's almost the end of the work we do now. You know, when we start designing the logo thing, that's kind of, it's, everything's over at that point. Like, all the work has happened before that, where we spent a lot of times defining these qualities and these inchoate terms and trying to go and figure out those things out and match those to the place that we're working for. And I would say that's, that's kind of the design of branding. And, and, you know, the graphic design part of it seems almost after the fact at this point, you know, so. Yeah, then also I think it's, um, it's, uh, it's sometimes kind of confusing to sort of think if we say design, sometimes the implication is we're talking about good design. But I think, uh, <laughs> you know, I think there's plenty of design in the way that Mr. Trump has kind of amplified that brand. Sure. It's like lots of design decisions made all the time about it. the typeface his name is written in and the exact shade of shiny gold it's reproduced in. Uh, but also an example of yeah. where it's not about consistency, really. Uh, yeah. You know, that if you look at one Trump Tower to the next, it's not always the same Trump logo on that. But there's something that ties it together in this big mass of stuff, which is, you know, the you plane looks one way and the tower looks something else, but it's all, I guess, brash in the same way. And that, that's really what the heart of it is. And so it doesn't need exactly the same gold. There might be lots of different golds or exactly the same typeface or but somehow it all hangs together because it all exudes this quality 
And I think that's the really strange thing that Brandon yeah, yeah, becomes. Yeah, yeah. And, it, and it's weird that it's sort of he achieves. I well, I don't. I, you know, I, I can't. I, I can't tell whether what we see is a result of this maniacal attention to detail, which you would think it is because he sort of seems capable of right. rejecting, you know, sign after sign until it's exactly has that bigliness quality. <laughs> right. You know, I mean, I, I, you, yeah. on the other hand, you know, you contrast with, I mean, the legendaries. Yeah. You know, by the way, what designers, all designers, either want secretly or really, is that one person who can just say yes or no. And once you un once you sort of figure out what what is yes, you have your Medici, uh, who will serve as your patron and make you famous. Once you kind of have that code, and I'm most certain online. that's the role Trump plays. I'm sure yeah. th you know five things are put in front of him, and he's like that one. Yeah, and that's the branding process, right? It it, it, see, it feels right to him. And in fact, it. oddly enough, there was before, uh, at the time of the Republican convention. He, there was a hot mic on stage when he was talking to Ivanka and a couple other people about the lettering of the that was being used in the teleprompter, and it was the it was it was the only time ever I've ever heard him talking in a normal human affable way, where he was just kind of like he wasn't yelling, he wasn't being mad, he wasn't saying I want it bigger. And he says he says oh, I think that one is a little bit easier to read. What do you think? You know, they had this kind of like normal conversation about it. I, and I remember thinking, yeah, he might make a great president. No, I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe, maybe we should. Uh, okay, let's see if we can just do uh, one, one more. With short, we'll do one short more? answers. Yes, they're yeah. short. Short. Yeah. To your point about nostalgia, how do we make America Budweiser again? <laughs> <laughs> and, and, you know, if you're Anheuser Busch and you've gone for years happily displaying patriotic imagery and colors, but to actually co-opting the American name for a summer. Where do you go from there? Um, I, I mean, I, when I saw that, I remember thinking, now, I would have loved to have been in that meeting. They, they, they must have just thought they've got, like, they've really got it this time. This is it. <laughs> and you know, and I have to admit, there's, um, um, like when you're actually talking to a client about a solution, there's really only two ways you can go. Uh, like you either go in with something that just is buttressed by safety on, on so many sides that it just seems as logical as a solution to a geometric proof, and it just is inarguable, or else it's a call to daring. Do you like? I swear to God, God help me. I have like done things where I've shown options, and I've sort of listed the pros and cons of each option, and like the one I want sometimes, and I don't do this that often, I've done it in a while, in fact, but I have done it. The one that I wanted to sell, I made the only con be, like requires real courage to approve. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that horrible? God, I haven't done that lately. That's, that's the mark of a, of a young. You're giving away the designer. secret. That's so right. I mean, I, I really don't know. I think that you know, what's no no other beer can do that now, and yeah. perhaps no one else can do that now. And and I'm not sure that you think that worked for them. Not really. I mean, I think people sort of raise their eyebrow at, it, and, and people who drink Budweiser are just going to keep drinking Budweiser. Yeah, but like, you know what I, th I think it probably did was it probably generated so much extra discussion around it, yeah. the whole fact of whether they should do it or not, you know. And I remember the, it was, there was, I can't remember the brand even, but someone had proposed that they were going to project their logo on the moon. <laughs> and it was a completely impossible notion, but just the idea they were going to do it generated so much discussion yeah. around, it, around this idea that should you do it, should the moon be used for <laughs> logos display, you know, so it's all kind of... And so, you know, it, it, in a way, it worked by this viral aspect. Of, so, you know, in a way, the, the thing itself doesn't really have to work. It was something else can happen. So. Well, um, speaking about the moon, <laughs> we have um, run out of time. Oh, okay. And I know we could stay and talk all evening. This was great. Thank you so much, uh, Michael and Michael. <laughs> fantastic. <laughs>